This video is brought to you by Squarespace. From websites and online stores to marketing tools and analytics, Squarespace is the all-in-one platform to build a beautiful online presence and run your business. Check out Squarespace through the link in the description below. More on them in a bit. People caught in their own yards grope for the doorstep. Cars come to a standstill, for no light in the world can penetrate that swirling muck. We live with the dust, eat it, sleep with it, watch it strip us of our possessions and the hope of possessions. This is Avis D. Carlson remembering firsthand the horrific realities of surviving through the Dust Bowl. For 10 years, millions of Americans suffered unimaginable hardship as a result of this tragic confluence of geography, weather, and human impact. A terribly unfortunate series of events in the preceding half century set the stage for a decade of destruction. But what caused the Dust Bowl, and how did it wreak havoc on a mass scale unseen before or since? The term Dust Bowl most commonly refers to a series of droughts that struck the Great Plains of the central United States during the 1930s. Beginning in 1930 with a period of prolonged drought, severe dust storms became regular occurrences the following year, lasting the entire decade. Though it's often referred to as if it were a single event, the Dust Bowl consisted of several episodes of drought that occurred in rapid succession. The regions affected were not able to recover from one drought before the next began, creating a cycle of chaos that affected the entire nation. The area heavily impacted by the droughts and subsequent dust storms approximates to around 100 million acres, an incomprehensible expanse of farmlands that stretched across several U.S. states, including Kansas, Oklahoma, and Texas, as well as parts of Colorado, New Mexico, and Nebraska. Tens of thousands of family farms were destroyed, crippling the economies of entire states. Well over three million Americans were uprooted from their homes and forced to migrate to other regions of the country. Many of these displaced people moved to California in search of better economic opportunity and a fresh start, but the abysmal conditions in the Midwest were only incrementally better across the entire United States because the country was in the throes of the Great Depression. So many Midwesterners, especially Oklahomans, fled the carnage of their home state that the term Oki became common derogatory slang in reference to these desperate refugees, even those not from Oklahoma. The estimated three and a half million Americans displaced as a result of the Dust Bowl makes it the single largest migration in U.S. history. To best comprehend what caused the Dust Bowl in such a place at such a time, we must first understand the series of poorly conceived human decisions that allowed for such a phenomenon to occur. When these decisions are placed in the context of their physical geography and combined with the usual weather conditions, the recipe for a perfect storm of disaster begins to take shape. The physical geography of the Great Plains is nothing particularly unusual, but it deserves mention nonetheless. The region most directly impacted by the black blizzards, as they were often referred to, was considered high plains, with elevation ranging from 2,500 to 6,000 feet. Very little rainfall, usually less than 20 inches per year, lands on these high plains, which classifies them as semi-arid. Long periods of drought are interspersed with years of heavy rainfall, and in the heavy rain years, crops are bountiful, but the extended droughts experienced in the region can cause crops to fail. High winds are also common across wet and dry years on the semi-arid high plains. These conditions on their own are quite common around the world, with other regions like the vast Eastern European steppe experiencing similar geography and rainfall. However, the unique human impact on these North American plains in the half-century preceding the Dust Bowl has not been seen again in human history. Massive, sun-baked plains that receive enough rainfall to cultivate them were seen as a proverbial gold mine for the ever-expanding United States during the 19th century. Beginning during the Civil War, Congress began implementing a series of federal land grants programs available to many Americans. The Homestead Act of 1862 was the first of these federal land grants, providing settlers with 160 acres of public land under the condition that it would be used for cultivation. Up until that point, European-style surplus agriculture on the American plains was deemed impossible due to the lack of surface water and timber for building infrastructure. However, with the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad in 1869, increased access allowed settlers to flock to these Great Plains to establish their own homestead farms. Homestead farms differ from European-style surplus agriculture because homesteaders only intend to grow enough crops to sustain themselves with the ultimate goal of becoming self-sufficient permanent residents. As prospective homesteaders settled across the Great Plains, the region experienced a prolonged period of heavy rainfall that 
skewed perspective positive in terms of ability to survive off the land. It was a commonly held belief among rural Americans at the time that rain follows the plow, and increased rainfall in the plains region reinforced this misconception that as more settlers cultivated the plains, the conversion of the land would alter the weather pattern and enact consistently higher rainfall than was previously recorded. Another contributing idea that encouraged homesteaders to move to the Great Plains was the concept of manifest destiny. Manifest destiny was the widespread belief that it was the God-given right of the American people to settle the continents from coast to coast, claiming lands from the Atlantic Ocean in the east to the Pacific Ocean in the west as their own. Until the aforementioned completion of the Transcontinental Railroad in the wake of the Civil War, this belief in manifest destiny was more of a utopian ideal than a realistic possibility. The 3,000 miles separating coast from coast were mostly wilderness, and the Great Plains that make up the heartlands of the North American continent were considered the Great American Desert. Not only were the plains considered a desert because of the arid, shapeless landscape, but also because it was a desert of Western culture and a stronghold for Native American tribes who commonly protected their tribal lands from those traversing them. The mere idea of crossing through the heartland and coming out the other side unscathed was a hopeful proposition at best. However, a single ribbon of steel track that carried goods and people safely and efficiently completely undid this long-held belief that the central North American plains were untamable and ambitious settlers took notice. By the end of the 19th century, several thousand families had settled these Great Plains and were experiencing surprisingly bountiful crop yields as a result of the prolonged period of heavy rains. Scientists, politicians, land speculators, and homesteaders all agreed that cultivating the land would permanently affect the rainfall in the area and make the land more suitable for farming, and Congress echoed this sentiment. In 1904, Congress enacted the Kincaid Act, granting 640 acres of public land to settlers in Nebraska, and in 1909, the Expanded Homestead Act was introduced, granting 320 acres of public land to settlers elsewhere on the plains. Almost immediately after introducing these new bills that further incentivized settlements of the Plains region, World War I broke out in Europe. The bloodiest war in human history also destroyed much of the grain crop in Europe as a byproduct of such a messy conflict, so Europeans turned to their North American neighbors for both financial and agricultural support. The sharp decrease in European crops greatly increased demand for U.S. ones, so farmers drastically increased cultivation across the Great Plains. In some regions, such as eastern New Mexico and northwest Texas, the amount of land cultivated went up sixfold between 1900 and 1930 to match the ever-increasing demand for grain and other staple crops in Europe and the U.S. alike. In doing so, farmers enacted practices that left their lands susceptible to large-scale erosion. The most common methods of doing this were deep plowing the fields, which completely destroyed native grasses that kept topsoil in place, as well as leaving cotton fields bare in the winter months when winds were often strongest. In high in hindsight, it seems both of these environmentally taxing agricultural practices were a desperate attempt to meet soaring demands, but the cost of taking such shortcuts would soon become apparent to all of those who practiced them. The 1920s is commonly referred to as the Roaring Twenties due to the prosperous and fun-loving lifestyle that many Americans enjoyed during this decade. The moniker holds true when applied to the Midwest homestead farmers as well, because grain demands were at an all-time high and the unusually plentiful rains in the region continued, both ideal conditions for farmers. However, all this prosperity came tumbling down with the stock market crash on Black Monday in 1929, an infamous single-day economic collapse that kicked off the Great Depression. With this economic downturn came the plummeting of grain prices, a total contrast from the two decades of prosperity that Midwestern farmers were used to experiencing. As prices dropped, homesteaders scrambled to respond, and many planted bumper crops in order to recover some of their financial losses. A bumper crop is just code speak for an unusually large crop, but in planting this bumper crop, many farmers deep plowed previously virgin topsoil, exposing thousands of additional acres of bare land to harsh winds. Within a year, the bountiful rains experienced in the region during the early 20th century completely dried up, and in 1930 a severe drought began that would continue intermittently until 1940. By 1931, severe dust storms became regular occurrences up in the region, and thus commenced a decade long nightmare known as the Dust Bowl.
Now, just before we really dig into their nightmare, let me take a quick moment to tell you about today's sponsor, Squarespace. Now, a couple of things. Maybe you've got an idea for a website or a business or a podcast or something knocking around in your mind and you're like, well, I should try that. Well, two, the only way to figure out whether that is worth doing is to give it a try. And often, the best way to get it out there into the world is with a website. And the best way to do a website is, of course, with Squarespace. Squarespace allows you to create a powerful website for whatever you're up to. You want to sell something online? Sure easily set up a store with Squarespace. You want to do a podcast? You want to do a YouTube channel even? Well, if you're doing a podcast, yes, they handle it. YouTube channel, you want a complimentary website. It all starts on Squarespace with a beautiful template that you just customize to your heart's content or start from scratch or move over from an existing domain. All super easy to manage. My recommendation, just use a template. No excuses. And once you've gone through the easy customization process, no updates, no patches, no tech nonsense for you to deal with. There's also 24-7 customer support who are there to help you whenever you've got a question. So head to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com forward slash geographics and you'll save 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain. With the onset of drought in 1930, the barren topsoil was left exposed with no rain or grasses to hold it down, and strong winds picked up thousands of tons of dust. As the wind carried the dust, it turned into a fine powder and created gigantic dust storms. Enormous dust storms became commonplace across the Great Plains in the early 1930s, coating everything in their path with a powdery red dust. By 1934, 35 million acres of land previously used for farming had been rendered useless, and an additional 125 million acres was losing its topsoil. In May 1934, a particularly powerful two-day dust storm rampaged across South Dakota, and the powder carried some 700 miles east before depositing 12 million pounds of dust in Chicago. Within two more days, the same storm traveled another 800 miles east, dumping red powder across the East Coast cities like New York, Washington, D.C., and Boston, to name a few. In winter of the same year, red snow fell in New England. There are even several instances of red dust coating ships in the western Atlantic Ocean. Closer to the epicenter of these black blizzards, conditions were much worse. Clouds of dust, sometimes miles high, blotted out the sun for days at a time. The dust collected in drifts like an apocalyptic snowstorm, and residents were often forced to clear the mountains of grainy earth with shovels. Even in the most well-built and sealed homes of the time, the dust sought out any openings and infiltrated every surface in the building, leaving a coating on floors, furniture, food, and even the unfortunate residents of such homes. The worst of all the storms hit on April 14, 1935. It's estimated that 3 million tons of topsoil gathered in the air above the Oklahoma Panhandle on that day alone, and the dust from the storm carried east and coated several entire states. News reporting on the storm nicknamed the day Black Sunday for the ominous nature in which the sun disappeared behind a towering wall of darkness. One report of this storm coins the term Dust Bowl to describe the plain states most directly impacted by frequent dust storms and this phrase soon caught on and became the de facto descriptor of the dust storms and the region in which they occurred. The human impact of the Dust Bowl cannot be overlooked. Thousands of Midwesterners developed dust pneumonia, which caused chest pains and shortness of breath, and in severe cases could result in death. No exact record exists of how many lives were lost as a direct result of dust pneumonia, but estimates range from hundreds well into the thousands. Beyond those facing serious medical conditions from the dust, millions more suffered the consequences in other aspects of life. School closures were commonplace during this period as it was physically dangerous for students and teachers to travel to and from schools. Teacher Taletta Elfeld recounts, One day in March 1934, my beginners were busy reading. All of a sudden there was a total darkness. It was as though a huge curtain had been drawn around our building. I realized a dust had hit because soon the room was filled with a fog of dust. We teachers walked home holding wet towels over our faces in order to breathe. In other instances, teachers recall lighting lanterns during the middle of the day so children could see to recite their lessons. There are even cases of teachers keeping students in the schoolhouse through the night so that they wouldn't get lost walking home or be overcome by dust. 
The severe droughts that lasted throughout the 1930s, combined with the regular black blizzards, killed crops across hundreds of millions of acres. By 1936, the economic cost of the storms reached $25 million a day, equivalent to $460 million in today's money. The billions of dollars lost each year further exacerbated the Great Depression, and thousands of farm families feared starvation. The especially poor economy in the Dust Bowl region forced millions of Americans to migrate to other states, especially California, and it was not just farmers who were affected. By examining census statistics, the bleak picture becomes more clear. Only 43% of those who moved to California during the 1930s were doing farm work immediately before arrival, and about one-third of these new arrivals were either professional or white-collar workers not involved in agriculture at all. This is reflective of how entire economies of Dust Bowl states collapsed, leaving teachers, doctors, police, and anyone who lived in these communities with no choice but to flee the region. In the 1930s, approximately 3.5 million residents fled the Great Plains states and migrated elsewhere. As mentioned previously, this made the Dust Bowl exodus the largest single migration in U.S. history. The hardest-hit state was Oklahoma, who lost over 440,000 residents between 1930 and 1940, most of whom traveled west to look for work. Around 250,000 of these poverty-stricken Oklahomans settled in California between 1935 and 1940, particularly in the agriculturally rich San Joaquin Valley. The impact on population in the Dust Bowl states lasted for decades, with the hardest counties experiencing population decline well into the 1950s. About one in eight Californians today can trace their heritage to Oki descent, a startling reminder of the sheer volume of migrants in dire straits during the height of the drought. This type of migratory Midwesterner was so common that the term Oki became common derogatory slang for those from any Dust Bowl state seeking respite from their dusty homelands. These Okies were the subject of harsh discrimination, often being subjected to the most menial labor tasks and unsustainably low wages upon arrival in California. The level of desperation among Okies was such that they had no choice but to accept whatever pitiable job and wage they were offered, and Californian farmers in need of cheap labor took full advantage of their miserable reality. <laughs> Already faced with an unprecedented economic depression and with the prospect of another global conflict on the horizon, the US government did not immediately jump to action to aid those suffering as a result of the Dust Bowl. Federal aid was first given in 1932 to the drought-affected states, but it was not until the fall of 1933 that the federal government reallocated funds with the specific intention of drought relief. A number of federal agencies were established between 1933 and 1935 in order to help poverty-stricken or displaced farmers. In 1935, President Franklin D. Roosevelt directly addressed the environmental degradation that allowed for the Dust Bowl in the first place as he enacted the Prairie States Forest Project. The program had local farmers plant trees to act as windbreaks on farms in the Plain States in an attempt to mitigate the effects of the wind and subsequent dust storms. The Soil Erosion Service was also established by Roosevelt in 1935 for the same purpose, and it showed farmers safer cultivation techniques that minimize soil erosion. A 1937 report shows that over one in five rural families was receiving federal emergency aid across the Great Plains region. By 1940, the drought subsided, and in 1941, rainfall levels returned to near normal in most regions of the Great Plains. American entry into World War II in 1941 pulled the economy kicking and screaming out of the depths of economic depression. The worst was over, but the economic impact in the Plains region persisted. Land values had plummeted from a decade prior. Farmers were not knowledgeable about how best to make use of their lands in which the topsoil had eroded, and they continued to grow crops and wheat on this barren land instead of switching to animals and hay practices that do not rely nearly as heavily on having a layer of topsoil. The unprecedented nature of the Dust Bowl left farmers generally unprepared to change their agricultural practices, so economic recovery was slow. In terms of art and culture, John Steinbeck famously encapsulated the tragic plight of Okies in his 1939 American classic The Grapes of Wrath. Dorothea Lange exposed rural poverty during the Dust Bowl in a photography series for the Farm Securities Administration, while Alexander Hoag painted landscapes depicting the Dust Bowl. Folk singer Woody Guthrie lyricized the economic hardships faced by Oki scraping by in California as he was an Oki himself who experienced the poverty and discrimination firsthand. The Dust Bowl is a dark cloud in American history, often overshadowed by the Great Depression that it coincided with and World War II that immediately followed. Yet for those millions of Americans swept from their homes, a legacy of poverty, discrimination, and ruin still whistles through their minds like the ferocious dusty winds of Black Sunday. <laughs>
So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe for brand new videos like this. Also, please do check out our fantastic sponsor, Squarespace, who I'm linking to below. And thank you for watching.